She is a truly enigmatic figure from the ancient world. Some view her as a trailblazer, others as a traitor to her religion. A woman who is increasingly identified by scholars as a pharaoh in her own right. Married to religious zealot and stepmother to Egypt's most famous pharaoh. She is the iconic Nefertiti. The material and textual evidence relating to her life has been the subject of study for more than 150 years, and yet the truth surrounding Nefertiti remains one of ancient Egypt's great mysteries. Unlike many rulers of the New Kingdom, such as Seti I and Ramses II, whose expertly mummified remains allow us to learn about their lives and their deaths, Nefertiti's mummy has eluded Egyptologists. Many theories exist regarding her ultimate fate, while numerous conspiracy theories swirl online. But which should we believe? And which are even plausible? Now filmmaker and Egyptologist Curtis Ryan Woodside has teamed up with many of the leading experts in his search for Nefertiti. In order to determine whether her mummy has already been found, or whether her body has even survived the past three and a half millennia. We want to encourage the real Queen Nefertiti to stand up. Mummy 21B is actually a strong contender for Nefertiti. There have been lots of attempts to try and deny that Nefertiti could be the mother of Tutankhamun. Well, if we have a mummy, what can we actually learn from it? And it's likely that the mummies of thousands of royal figures were lost to history. Where is Nefertiti? It is a question on the lips of many Egyptologists. Has the mummy of Nefertiti already been found? The lead contender for this identification has, for many years, been a mummy found in an 18th dynasty tomb in the Valley of the Kings, known to archaeologists as KV-35. This mysterious mummy was not the tomb's original owner. Rather, she was most likely placed there some years after her original burial, in order to protect her from looting. This mummy was found in a side chamber of the tomb, alongside an older woman and a young man. The older lady has been identified through DNA testing of a lock of hair from Tutankhamun's tomb. She is Queen T, the grandmother of Tutankhamun and the mother of Nefertiti's husband, Akhenaten. We found that the mummy known as Elder Lady, this mummy, people said she could be Queen T because there is a hair found in the tomb of King Tut in a box. They took the sample of this hair and they analyzed that with the hair of this lady and they said they are matching. But also this one will never confirm that this could be Queen T. But with Yuya and Tuya, DNA and T, we are able to find out that she is the daughter this elder lady, she's the daughter of Yuya and Tuya, and the wife of Amenhotep III. The identification of Queen T amongst this cache of three mummies has led many scholars to suspect that the other two mummies were members of her close family. In consequence, the mummy of the younger lady has been thought to be the elusive Nefertiti. Whilst the reburial of Nefertiti with family members would make sense, DNA samples taken from the younger lady would appear to prove otherwise. Professor Aidan Dodson of Bristol University has studied the younger lady in some detail whilst writing his book Nefertiti, Queen and Pharaoh, published in 2020. He has his own thoughts on who this woman may be. One of the 
key questions, of course, about Nefertiti is what happened to her mummy? And this is very much tied in with the question about the identity of a mummy found in 1898 in the tomb of Amenhotep II, known generally as the younger woman or the younger lady. However, when the, a number of mummies were DNA tested and the results published in 2010, um, all this rather changed. The uh, results as published um, said that the uh, younger lady was not only the mother of Tutankhamun, but was his mother by a brother-sister marriage. Now, this presents a number of problems because neither of the known wives of Akhenaten, um, Nefertiti and Kia, um, are royal sisters. And if they were, that would certainly be included in their, um, in their titulary. And also that there is no sister of Akhenaten recorded as his wife at the time when you'd expect to find um, Tutankhamun being born. And there are also other sources at Amarna where if there were a third queen, you would actually expect to find some kind of mention. The same DNA signature in Tutankhamun, which would appear to come from a brother-sister marriage from his parents, is also to be found if you have three generations of first cousin marriages involved. But amongst the um, suggestions um, has been that Nefertiti was the uh, daughter of Ai, and that Ai was a son of Yuya, um, and therefore a brother of Queen T. Also, going back a couple of generations, there are other suggestions which would fit in again with first cousin marriages. The only thing to make this work genealogically for the younger lady to be Nefertiti and also the mother of Tutankhamun is for her mother to have been a sister of Amenhotep III. Now, there is no trace of a wife of I with that background. So, on that basis, one can produce a credible uh, um, family tree, which would make the younger woman first cousin, result of a series of first cousin marriages of Akhenaten, and most likely, I think, Nefertiti. And there have been lots of attempts to try and deny that Nefertiti could be the um, mother of Tutankhamun. That's only on the basis that she's only ever shown with daughters. But that ignores the history of Egypt up until that point, where kings and queens are only ever shown with daughters. Sons are never shown as part of a family group. So to almost uh, to ask for Tutankhamun to appear in these procession of daughters you find on so many of Akhenaten's monuments is really to ask for something which shouldn't actually exist up until that point in Egyptian history. It's only under the Ramessides that you find mass um, representations of royal sons and daughters. So on that basis, I think a reasonable case can be made for the younger lady being Nefertiti and simultaneously Tutankhamun's mother. The age of the uh, body has been estimated at between 25 and 35. Aging of ancient bodies of that kind of age is notoriously problematic. But between 25 and 35 actually works quite nicely for Nefertiti because she presumably will have married Akhenaten when she was in her early to mid-teens, say 15. Um, and then she has a career of the 17 years of her husband's reign, plus at least three years following on from that as female king at Nefenefruata. One thing the identification of this mummy with Nefertiti does, however, is says something about the way her life ended, because the body has very, very serious facial wounds. Thought to be caused by um, tomb robbers who hacked through wrap, who wrappings to get at the, um, the valuables. But when the body was CAT scanned a few years ago, the analysis showed that the, there were fragments in the sinuses which wouldn't have been there if the body had been a dried husk 
when it was damaged. That could only have got there if the body had been alive at the moment the wound was um, infected. That wound is so severe that it certainly would have caused massive hemorrhaging and probably death through um, blood loss or shock very, very rapidly. All of which would suggest that if, say, if this is a correct identification of it, and even if it isn't Nefertiti, it's still the mother of Tutankhamun, that she died a horrible death, whether by accident, design, or disguised um, design as an accident. So therefore, this body is a fascinating one and throws up all sorts of interesting questions. But say, I think one can make a good case for it to be Nefertiti, although there is absolutely no sort of smoking gun and one can't say QED um, at this point in time. With scholars divided over the identity of the younger lady, where does this leave the search for Nefertiti? There have been other candidates over the years, yet the majority have been eliminated as dating from the wrong dynasty, or indeed due to the mummification processes employed, not even hailing from senior nobility. This leaves just one remaining candidate from among the two otherwise unidentified female mummies discovered in an unfinished and undecorated tomb in the Valley of the Kings. I have my own thoughts on who the mummy of Nefertiti could be. The two female mummies in KV21 have not actually received much attention. However, in recent years, Egyptologists have started to take a closer look at these two mystery women. Sophia Aziz, an Egyptologist and mummy expert, has been investigating KV21 with some interesting results. The KV-21 mummies sadly have been through a really rough ordeal. It's remarkable that they've survived at all. The tomb itself was first discovered in 1817 by an extraordinary character of Egyptology. His name was Giovanni Belzoni, an Italian man of great stature, strength and intelligence. He was known as an adventurer, an explorer, and to some, the father of modern Egyptology. He had an interest in hydraulics and even thought about becoming a monk, but he somehow ended up in Egypt discovering temples and tombs while getting involved in fist fights, dodging bullets, and competing with rivals. And when Balsoni discovered the tomb, he was in reasonably good condition, as were the two mummies within the tomb. He even describes their hair as long and well-preserved. This, however, all changed when the tomb was rediscovered in 1989. By this time, it was evident that the tomb had been flooded for a considerable length of time, so both the mummies would have been submerged in this water. Additionally, some graffiti was discovered, indicating that visitors had been in and out of the tomb in fact, even the mummy's hair was now missing, probably taken as a souvenir. Now, it's quite incredible that the two mummies were still within the tomb. And this could be because the tomb was undecorated, it was uninscribed, and there weren't any clues really to the identities of these two mummies. So this could be the reason why they were just left there, which is actually quite sad the way they were sort of discovered, discarded, forgotten about, and then rediscovered, now known as Mummy 21A and 21B, CT analysis was conducted. And the CT results are interesting. So by now, Mummy 21A had actually lost her head and her body her was in pieces. She had postmortem fractures with some body parts missing. She was the younger of the two. Mummy 21B was determined to be in her 40s. Although she did have her head intact, her right eye was missing, her nose was missing, but it was determined to have been small and narrow. It also looked like her brain had not been extracted through the usual nasal route, and her heart was no longer in her body, but she did have resin-soaked pads within her body cavity. 
She also displayed signs of osteoarthritis, which would be indicative of a woman in her 40s. So, it, you know, it was difficult to really identify the mummies with the state of preservation. But looking at the age difference between them, Mummy 21A being in her 20s, the other one being in her 40s, it's quite possible they were mother and daughter. And this would, this would reflect the fact that they were interred together as well. And what's also interesting is that they had bent elbows and clenched fists, which would indicate that they were both royal mummies. Between 2007 and 2009, molecular analysis was conducted of a number of mummies from the New Kingdom period. This was to see if they were related. Now, amongst these mummies was the famous Tutankhamun, the two fetuses discovered in his tomb, and mummies 21A and 21B. The technique used by the team was genetic fingerprinting, which looks at short tandem repeats. These are repeated sequences found within the non-coding region of DNA. So these repeats vary between individuals. So by comparing the repeats um, across a number of microsatellites, it's possible to work out whether or not people are related. Genetic fingerprinting is used in paternity, maternity tests, genetic disorder testing, identifying unknown human remains, and in crime scenes. So if you've ever watched a crime scene investigation series, you'll know that at the crime scene, forensic evidence is gathered. If DNA is successfully extracted, hopefully to find a match. The problem with ancient DNA is that it tends to be heavily degraded. And this is due to processes such as autolysis after death, when the body's own enzymes start to self-destruct. And also the burial environment can also have an impact. Chemical, physical processes can further degrade the DNA and of course microbial attack. So all of these factors can really have an impact on the DNA. When the study was conducted and the results released, this really left the academic field divided with those that thought it was possible to extract ancient DNA and those argued that it's virtually impossible. So the reason for this was that at that time, extracting ancient DNA was still relatively new. And there'd been some studies in which it was claimed they had successfully extracted DNA only to find out it was due to modern contamination. The team, however, said that they took um, precautions. So they extracted the ancient DNA from deep within the bones, thereby trying to rule out contamination. Also, they had genotyped all the team that were involved in the study to rule out contamination. It was argued that it would have been more suitable to extract mitochondrial DNA. And this is because mitochondrial DNA, which is passed from the mother, is just better preserved than nuclear DNA. However, the team did eventually publish their mitochondrial results as well. But if we look at the data, so mummies 21A and 21B, we know that it's most likely the DNA would have been heavily degraded. If we think about the environment that they were in, being submerged in water, they were handled a lot, visitors were in and out of the tomb. So we'd expect the data not to really reveal a lot. And this was actually the case. The team were un unable to retrieve sufficient data. 
So this does actually reflect the fact that the DNA would have been damaged. The only way to reconcile the differences is probably to do next generation sequencing, which is a more sensitive, high throughput technique, which is much more suitable for heavily degraded DNA. Now, if we look at the context of the burial itself, if we look at the location of the tomb, and we look at the fact that both these ladies were interred together, they both had these clenched fists and bent elbows, it's quite likely that they were mother and daughter, and they would have been royal. So if we look at Mummy 20, on B. She's in her 40s. She has that degenerative condition. And if we look at Nefertiti's portrayal in her latter life, she is depicted as an older lady. So I mean 21B is actually a strong contender for Nefertiti. For me, the mummy KV21B is the strongest candidate for Nefertiti. If the DNA is anything to go by, it could be her. Even the mummy KV21A has been found to be the daughter of KV21B. Now, this could be huge, as we do not actually have a DNA source for Nefertiti. The headless KV21A has been linked by DNA results to the two stillborn children found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. That could only mean one thing, that the headless mummy KV21A is in fact the sister and wife and the mother of the two children of Tutankhamun. This mummy KV21A that I believe is Tut's sister Anke Senamun even shares some similarities with the body of Tut, including some of the genetic bodily deformations. If she is Anke Senamun, that makes KV21B her mother, and we know that the mother of Anke Senamun was none other than Nefertiti. Therefore, 21B could in fact be Nefertiti. The reason that we don't have a DNA profile for Nefertiti is because we're not actually sure who her parents are. She has been linked to be the daughter of Pharaoh I. Now you see, Tuya and Yuya had three children. They were Queen T, the royal astronomer Anan, and I. In Amana, I has been referred to as the god's father. This would indicate that he is the father of a daughter that has married the pharaoh, which would be Nefertiti. So this title links I to be the father of Nefertiti quite nicely. In my opinion, it is entirely possible that KV21B is Nefertiti. If you just look at the face of the mummy, and you look at the representations that we have of Nefertiti, the similarities are striking. Now, I am not in any way a forensic pathologist or an expert at facial reconstruction. However, I have my own way of doing an artistic representation, an artistic reconstruction of a mummy. When you look at KV21B, you first of all notice the long, slender neck and of course, the strong jawline. However, you also start to notice the eyes. She has painted on eyeliner on the mummy in the thin style, which we can only associate with the bust of Nefertiti. Because KV21B's head has been damaged in later years by grave robbers, one of her eyes is actually missing. So what I did in my reconstruction process was I took the one eye on the one side, duplicated that, inverted it and lined it up to the skull. 
That way I could have a symmetric face to work with. Then what I start to do, I start to outline key features on the mummy. And what I started to notice was this mummy shared a lot of the lines on the face that we would associate with Nefertiti, such as the jowls by the mouth, also the lines under the eyes are strikingly similar to the Nefertiti Berlin bust. Even the cheekbones and jawline lines up pretty well. Even the nose, eye shape, and the lips line up pretty well with representations that we have of Nefertiti. I am in no way claiming that KV21B is 100% Nefertiti. However, for me, she is the closest contender. Have a look at the reconstruction that I have done and make up your own mind. This leaves us in a predicament because you see many Egyptologists are skeptical on the DNA results of KV21A and B. Some Egyptologists are still searching for the real Nefertiti. Today we want to encourage the real Queen Nefertiti to stand up. We have to remember this is not a photographic likeness of the queen. There was no such thing as portraiture in the Western sense in ancient Egypt. The torso in the Brooklyn Museum of Akhenaten, and you can notice that the cartouches are all hacked out. That's because the ancient Egyptians did everything they could to try to erase his memory. Because the ancient Egyptians purposefully tried to destroy the memory of the Amarna period, it is important for us Egyptologists to try to enlist the service of other individuals to help us to try to reconstruct that period. And one of the ways we can do this is by asking individuals that are involved in medicine and genealogical research to come to our assistance and collaborate with us. Science in the service of the humanities is a very, very valuable tool and then trying to identify Nefertiti and other members of the ancient Amarna family, the two mummies that are suggested to be the physical remains of Queen Nefertiti. The first, KV35YL. Another set of human remains that are suggested to represent Nefertiti were KV21B. So now, as a typical in ancient Egyptian studies, we have a clash of titans, two camps. Are the physical remains in KV35, younger lady, 
the remains of Nefertiti? Or are the physical remains of KV-21 B the physical remains of Nefertiti? And we know that she was not a twin. So one of these two identifications has to be dismissed. And here, in a nutshell, is how we unpackage the two theories so that you can make an educated conclusion about which of the identifications is the more compelling. And again, in 2019, the genetic markers of this mummy, KV35 younger woman, were compared, a very compelling evidence, that she is in fact able to be connected with that royal family. Now, as we look at KV21B, there were analyses that were conducted on this mummy in 2016 and 2021, but those genetic markers seem to be less numerous, and there are many, many more gaps in her genetic markers. By the fact that the DNA evidence did not support the identification of KV21B as Nefertiti, the proponents of that theory decided they would take another tack. And so they tried to press into service the use of a CAT scan and art historical data. And what they tried to do was to show that there was coincidence between the mummy and the cranium as revealed by a CAT scan. And so the method just described is academically flawed. So the two images that they chose represent an individual at two different stages in their life. And so it's inconceivable that a mummy can represent the two ends of a person's life, a younger and an older one. So, in my opinion, the superimposition of the mummy and the cranium as a result of a CAT scan on two different images that do not necessarily represent the same face is open to serious academic scrutiny. Or will you base your conclusion on the preponderance of evidence that scientific genealogical data provides? The answer is up to you. Hi, Kara. Hi, Curtis. How are you? I'm great. And you? Good, good. Hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> I, you know, I'm working on this new documentary and I was discussing it with you beforehand and, you know, you had some pretty interesting views about it and I just thought it would be great to have you share the your views in this documentary. So we're looking to see who are the candidates for Nefertiti's mummy. You know, what is your opinion or do you think she should still be a mystery? It's funny, there's all of this... Um hemming and hawing and discussion about which mummy is hers mm -hmm. and some have identified her based on hair um, some have identified her based on dna studies some have identified her based on location and i actually just steer clear of the argument almost entirely you know just standing on the sidelines with arms crossed and, and scowling from afar asking well if we have a mummy what can we actually learn from it Sometimes you can learn a great deal, sometimes not as much as you would like. Finding the mummy of Nefertiti, you know, what could it potentially teach us? Could it potentially sideline us into imposing certain theories or questions upon her? Mm -hmm. And I think that just the mummy of, of um, just the mummy of Hatshepsut and how much that how much attention the finding the mummy of Hatshepsut seems to have drawn from scholarship has, in my opinion, taken away from Hatshepsut's history, achievements, and, and many other 
issues that I think deserve more attention. So in some ways, I think the mummy chase is like the shiny thing over here. And I would rather be over here with my arms crossed, scowling, <laughs> looking <laughs> on outside. You want to learn more about what she did and who she was rather than, okay, there's the, the 3000 year old body. I, I don't, I, I say this to my graduate students all the time. I say it to my undergraduate students all the time. We should only be asking research questions that we have a chance of answering. And in the case of some mummies, unless there is a toe tag, unless there is a text assigned to this mummy, we will never truly know whose mummy is Nefertiti's. It's the same with Akhenaten. If these mummies aren't marked in some way that's definitive, there will always be some element of doubt and we will always be unsure about which mummy is whose. And so given that this is a research question that we actually cannot answer in the same way that I have students that want to write about Akhenaten, was he mad or strategic? Well, that's great. You can, you can touch that question, but you'll never be able to get to Akhenaten's psychological state because the Egyptians didn't leave anything about Akhenaten's psychological state. In the same way, if this mummy is not definitively marked, we can't know. And Nefertiti not being ostensibly a member of the 18th dynasty royal household, at least directly related, DNA studies are only going to be of so much use. And this is a circular argument of tail chasing that I would rather opt out of. If a woman's mummy is found whose DNA is linked to Tutankhamun, then why could it not be one of his sisters or, or somebody else in the family whom we don't know? Our attempts to find her may impose identities on mummies that are not her. It's not like the, the mummy of, let's say, Seti I or Ramses II, where we had their names on the bandages on the inside. Yeah. 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 This, is, this is basically all guesswork. Well, the, and the other thing floating about this research, Curtis, if I, if I may be so bold, is Nicholas Reeves' suggestion that Tutankhamun was buried in the foyer of the king who served before him. Mm -hmm. And the king who served before him was likely Smenkare. Smenkare's funerary materials have not been found in any way, shape, or form from the Valley of the Kings, which is highly unusual, and suggests that there is a tomb for Smenkare that we okay. maybe have not discovered yet, right? Yeah. And if you fit with, I would say, 30 to 40% of Egyptologists who are open to the idea that Nefertiti, because she shares the Ankhepru Rey name and no other king is taking on the throne name of another king, that would be a strange and aberrant thing to do. That Ankhepru Rey element does link Nefer Nefru Aten, whom we know is Nefertiti, with Smenkare. If Nefertiti is Smenkare, then we can be talking about this mummy identification all the time, but she may be hidden away someplace where we have not discovered her yet. That, that, dis, that theory of Nick Reeves haunts this entire discussion. And it is, it is a typical uh, ploy of researchers to say, but that tomb isn't here, we don't have it. My close examination of these scans highlighted the apparent presence of closed doorways on the west wall, potentially leading to an additional Tutankhamun period storeroom labeled X in the cutaway bottom left here. And that on the north to a corridor continuation of the tomb labeled Y. The proposal I put forward was that the burial of Tutankhamun was actually a tomb within a tomb. And the fact that we cannot find her is as much of interest to me in what the Egyptians chose to remember about female power in particular. That's where I would rather spend my time. I also see this certainty that's imposed generally swirling about documentaries uh, for television research, which I, I put research in scare quotes for that, and, and, and an ego driven attempt to connect a find, a discovery to a particular mummy or body and to create a, an arena of attention 
that yeah. that draws the gaze to Egypt and to that particular discoverer. So to be honest, I, I don't trust a lot of this discussion that's happening. Yeah, yeah. That's why I wanted to have this, this discussion with you because when I make documentaries, I want to keep it open. I want to have different opinions. I want to have the facts. As Kara mentioned, Nicholas Reeves has his own theory that Nefertiti is still yet to be discovered in an undiscovered chamber in Tutankhamun's tomb. Now, this is a very controversial issue amongst many. However, until we know 100% for sure, that too remains a mystery. It is possible that her mummy has been found already and is lying in a museum basement, uncatalogued. It could even be that she is in a private collection, or worst of all, she was maybe sold to a Victorian tourist and has since then been totally destroyed, as was fashionable at the time. Mummies have long been a source of fascination in the Western world, but what they used to be was kind of a commodity. It's long been believed that mummified bodies had magical properties. It was as if all the speculation regarding the mysticism and magic of the ancient pharaohs had literally become embodied in the remains of the Egyptians themselves. So mummies were used for esoteric and occult ingredients, love potions, health tinctures, that kind of thing. It was believed they had medicinal properties. They were even ground up and used in popular paint that was known as mummy brown. To think of this today is pretty shocking. I mean, the Victorians were consuming mummies, literally in a cannibalistic way. There's a level of dehumanization and disregard for human remains that finds its pinnacle in the famous mummy unwrapping parties. By the late 17th century, the physical consumption of mummies was falling out of favor, but the cultural consumption was only becoming more popular. One of the first recorded public unwrappings of a mummy is from the early 18th century. It was undertaken by an apothecary known as Christian Herzog, and he later published his findings. This was a new approach lent credence under the banner of scientific discovery. The spectacle began to overwhelm the research as the 19th century took hold. Famously, it was an Englishman named Thomas Pettigrew, later known as Mummy Pettigrew, who popularized the mummy unwrapping party concept. Pettigrew became interested in the subject after assisting famous explorer Giovanni Belzoni in an early unwrapping party held for physicians. The popularity of mummy unwrapping parties swelled in the 1830s. Early Victorian audiences found the mixture of spectacle, death and scientific research to be an irresistible cocktail. The last mummy unwrapping occurred in 1908 by Margaret Murray. That's just over a century of the public ruin of Egyptian bodies. Countless mummies were destroyed and lost to these centuries of Western consumption of Egyptian remains. And it's likely that the mummies of thousands of royal figures were lost to history. Given that we've never been able to positively identify the mummy of Nefertiti, it's entirely possible, maybe even likely, that her remains were discovered, uncategorized and lost in this manner. Been given permission to open the tomb of I myself with the key. It could be that her mummy is still lying inside her tomb, which is yet to be discovered. If Pharaoh I really is her father, it is possible that Nefertiti was buried in the Western Valley 
in Luxor, near her father Ai and her father-in-law Amenhotep III's tombs. Whilst it's entirely possible that Nefertiti's tomb, and indeed mummy, may still lie undiscovered beneath the sands of Egypt, it is equally possible that Nefertiti may remain, like so many aspects of ancient Egyptian culture and history, a tantalizing enigma for eternity.